Now at nine, tragedy in a Salt Lake City neighborhood. A girl is dead after police say she was shot by her brother. We'll tell you what happened this afternoon. Demolition for what's left of the homes that slid down this ravine. But why did Draper allow anything to be built here in the first place? We've had multiple developments that are on geologic hazards. Tonight, we ask the city that question. It was a nice spring day today, but come tomorrow, our wind kicks up. Does that mean a storm is moving in? and also when our flooding concerns return. This is going to allow us to be ahead of the game. Plus, the state-of-the-art technology that is helping Utah prepare for flooding as warming weather brings down our record snowpack. Well, it's been exactly one year since a 13-year-old West Jordan boy was hit and killed by a drunk driver while riding his bike. How the community came together tonight to honor and remember his life. Live from Utah's news leader, Fox 13 News at 9 starts right now. Tonight, we are learning more about Salt Lake City's latest homicide. This one, police say, involves a teen girl being shot and killed by her brother. Good evening, everyone. I'm Bob Evans. And I'm Kelly Chapman. It happened this afternoon at a house in Salt Lake City's Poplar Grove neighborhood. Poplar, rather. Fox 13 News reporter Jenna Bree shows us how the tragedy unfolded. It was just afternoon today when officers were called to this house on the 1600 block of West Wright Circle. Despite life-saving efforts by officers and paramedics, a teenage girl died on the scene. Hours after a teenage girl was shot and killed, a small memorial is building outside her home. At uh, this time, there is nobody that is outstanding as far as this invest investigation is concerned. Before officers arrived on scene, they say the shooter ran. Hey, Police then it. spotted the suspect on a UTA bus. He was arrested and identified as the teenage brother of the victim. It's going to be tasked with our homicide unit to uh, dis, you know, determine what exactly happened, if there was history or anything else that occurred here. Detective Ben Nielsen says nearby schools were put on secure alert after the shooting but resumed normal operations after the shooter was caught. We let them know that there was a situation in, you know, in the near vicinity, um, and they are the ones who elected to put their schools on lockdown, but there was no threat. Police say the shooter will be booked into the Salt Lake County Juvenile Detention Center on one count of murder. We will continue to keep you updated as we learn more about the victim and just what happened this afternoon. Reporting in Salt Lake City, Jenna Bree, Fox 13 News, Utah. If you or someone you know is experiencing domestic violence, free support is available 24-7. Just call 1-800-897-5465. You can also find resources from the Utah Domestic Violence Coalition at udvc.org. A Salt Lake City school teacher at Edison Elementary School has been charged with aggravated sexual abuse after being accused of inappropriately touching a young student. 44-year-old Jared Titchy is listed as a first grade teacher at the school. Charging documents indicate a 13-year-old student said while in second grade, Titchy touched her inappropriately multiple times. She said she had kept quiet for so long because she, quote, didn't know it was bad and didn't want to annoy anyone or make people think she was being overdramatic. The Salt Lake City School District says Titchy is currently on paid administrative leave. Also, parents of Taylorsville High School students were sent an email today sharing a student has been taken into custody after coming to the school parking area with a gun. The principal, Emmy Liddell, says just prior to the end of the school day, they got a report from an adult saying a student posted a picture of a weapon on social media. Within several minutes of getting the report, police were quickly able to find the student inside a vehicle in the parking lot. The school says they are notifying parents now after having to wait some time in order to not compromise the investigation. It has now been exactly one year since a 13 year old West Jordan boy was hit on his bike in a crosswalk by a drunk driver. Tonight, Fox 13 News reporter Chris Arnold shows us how the family of Eli Mitchell and many in the community are commemorating his life. So he is an awesome soul and he sort of came out of the womb that way. Lisa like, Mitchell you know, can't help but smile when describing her son Eli. And he also was amazing amazing at making friends. Someone she says was wise beyond his years at just 13 years old. Like even from a young age, 
he would say something and I'm like, where did where did this come from? What well, was a year ago today at this same time that police say that Eli was riding his bike here near 1510 West and 9000 South in West Jordan when he was hit while standing in a crosswalk by a drunk driver while he was on his bike. Me, Emma and Jeremy had no idea what was going on while this was all happening. We just kept getting texts to stay off 90. Back near where Mitchell affectionately calls Eli's corner tonight, the Mitchell family, friends, law enforcement officials and others all gathering to remember Eli's life with songs Eli's bike set him free and kind words, all a part of what the family is calling Eli's Angel Day. It's difficult. Eli was young. He had a lot of energy. His whole life was before him and had that cut short. There's nothing we can do now. We can do things to help prevent that from happening to others. That's the power to turn tragedy into triumph. Utah State Representative Ken Ivory worked with the Mitchell family in getting House Bill 247 passed during the last legislative session. After he says the man arrested for hitting and killing Eli, Mason Ohms, left a bar nearby and drove well four times over the legal limit. The bill helping clarify the definition of overserving alcohol at Utah bars. And we specified in legislation that if there is an injury from over service in a bar, that they have to retain the records. And the third thing that it did is it spelled out very clearly what someone that was injured in a tragedy like this would have to do to have their day in court. As stories were told and tears were shed, Mitchell spoke about the impact she hopes her son will continue to have on others. I hope that his impact is um, don't drink and drive. And then I hope that it is also just to live like he did. And those of us that knew him knew how he lived, but he, he lived big. In West Jordan, Chris Arnold, Fox 13 News, Utah. We have seen more flooding this year than in years past, and it's vital to be ahead of the rising water. Now the state will have more eyes on Utah's rivers and streams than ever before. Today, Governor Cox announced a new partnership with American Fork-based company LVT to install dozens of cameras around the state in the coming weeks. Some of the cameras are already available online right now. For any Utah to see how high the water is in places like the Weber River, the Provo River, and more, the governor says this new technology will be vital for flood mitigation. I've been spending a lot of time on the 1983 floods. I've been reading, I've read the FEMA after action reports. They did not have any of this type of technology to be able to monitor in real time what's happening out there. So this is a game changer for us and uh, we're, we're, we're lucky to have it here in the state of Utah. To take a look at these new cameras, go to utahflooding.com, utahflooding.com. You can also go to floods.utah.gov to not only monitor these cameras, but get additional information on how to protect your home and property. Well, those cameras may be vital because we are about to warm up in a rather big way in northern Utah, Allison. That's right. Well, today compared to yesterday, 15 degrees warmer for much of the state. It's still close to 60 degrees here in Salt Lake right now. So a beautiful spring evening, much of the state around 50 to 60 right now, 70 in St. George. We are under mostly clear sky as you're getting ready for bed on this Wednesday night. Temperatures over the next couple of hours dropping into the 40s for our overnight lows. So when you wake up tomorrow morning, we'll have mostly clear sky temperatures as we head into the overnight hours by 7 o'clock in the morning, about 35 to 45 for much of the state for tomorrow tomorrow morning. I should say tomorrow throughout the day. It'll be even warmer than it was today. So temperatures are on the rise, especially heading into this weekend. But come tomorrow, the wind is going to pick up. So does that mean a storm is moving in? Your forecast is coming up. Thanks, Allison. Well, Salt Lake City is planning some major upgrades for 1100 East. Tonight at Emerson Elementary School, the city hosted an open house so they could share their designs with residents for street designs from 9th South down to Logan Avenue. Some residents shared their concerns for noise and air pollution. Are they using all diesel uh, equipment? They're using all diesel backhoes, big trucks are all diesel. They start at 7 a.m. I said, what time do you finish? They said 4.30, and we'll see if that's the case. The one time will we'll kind of disrupt is um, when they rebuild the 11th East Harrison intersection, 
it's going to be reconstructed in concrete and it's going to be raised um, and that's basically because it's a school crossing for Elmerson Elementary. Now Barbara, who you heard from, said she felt for those who had questions, they were being told as much as the company knows. Today, the Utah Transit Authority celebrated 15 years of the front runner commuter train operating along the Wasatch Front. UTA held parties this afternoon at the Salt Lake Central, Provo Central, and Ogden Central stations with refreshments, photo ops, and fun items to hand out as a way to say thank you to riders. The people that I talk to when I ride every day, they love it. It's an integral part of their life. They go to school, they go to work, they go to visit relatives all across the Wasatch Front, and a lot of it originates along uh, Front Runner. Over the past 15 years, more than 48 million passengers have ridden on Front Runner trains. Future extensions are in the works, providing service as far north as Brigham City and as far south as Peyton. Payson. A medical examiner took the witness stand today in the Lori Vallow Daybell murder trial. What they revealed about how JJ Vallow and Tylee Ryan died. I've been up there to inspect and, and I feel for those neighbors. Why did Draper let anybody build homes on this spot in the first place? We asked that question. After pulling off two wins in Idaho, the Grizzlies with a chance to take a commanding 3-0 lead tonight in their playoff series. This was the 11th day of the Lori Vallow Daybell murder trial in Idaho. Graphic new details were revealed about the deaths of her children, J.J. Vallow and Tylee Ryan. And we do want to warn you, some of the details from today's testimony may be difficult for you to listen to. Court TV correspondent Chanley Painter reports from Boise. And good evening. It was a difficult day inside this courthouse for day 11 of the Lori Vallow Daybell trial, where medical experts told the jury how Lori's children died. Medical examiner Dr. Garth Warren spent most of the day on the stand walking the jury through the process of JJ and Tylee's autopsies after they were found buried in Lori's husband's backyard in June 2020. Seven year old JJ Vallow died due to asphyxiation after a plastic bag was put over his head and duct tape covering his mouth. According to the expert, there were signs that JJ struggled with scratch abrasions on his neck as if he was trying to remove the plastic bag. And then 16 year old Tylee Ryan's autopsy was much more complex. Her remains were received in three separate sealed bags and it took much longer for the expert to sift through bones and tissue. Ultimately, Dr. Warren told the jury that he could only rule her death as homicide by unspecified means, but he could say that she was murdered, dismembered and then burned. On cross examination, Lori's defense attorneys tried to poke holes in this expert's credibility. When I talked about swabbing the sinuses or swabbing the nasal cavity, you didn't do that? I've never heard anybody doing that in this type of situation. Okay, what type of situation are you talking about? Uh, bag over the head. Okay, so when someone has a bag over their head and they are, and I'm just going off of things I've seen in movies and whatnot, it seems That's like... That's scary. It's scary to you? Yeah, that you're going off movies. Okay, so, well, you're going off of... Uh, off of my knowledge knowledge okay the day culminated with a forensic anthropologist from the FBI telling the jury about the skeletal remains of Tylee Ryan she will be back on the stand tomorrow but for now I'm Chanley Painter reporting in Boise Idaho Court TV a court hearing got underway today in a lawsuit over Utah's cookie craze crumble is suing dirty dough accusing it of stealing trade secrets the company wants a restraining order against its competitor a federal judge began hearing testimony today well this is really cool tomorrow NASCAR legend Kyle Petty he's going to join the good day Utah team in studio to talk about a charity ride that he'll hold in Utah and Nevada the Kyle Petty Charity Race Across America will support Victory Junction. That's an organization providing life-changing camping experiences to kids with chronic medical conditions. You can hear more about that tomorrow morning right here on Good Day Utah during the 8 a.m. hour. 
What a beautiful spring afternoon and evening we currently have going on here across much of Utah for Salt Lake currently 59 degrees 53 for Provo 56 for Ogden mid 50s for Logan looking up towards Evanston though already chilly into the 30s in St. George you're currently 70. So here are your main weather headlines. We had a nice spring day today. Tomorrow's going to be breezy and then some flooding concerns do return as we head into this upcoming weekend. Mostly clear sky here across the state right now. We're going to see some passing clouds here across northern Utah. Those are going to move through the state overnight towards the southeast. For the Wasatch Front, we're going to see that most clearing after midnight with temperatures dropping into the 40s this evening. High pressure becomes our main story over the next few days. But come Thursday and Friday, we're going to have a little bit of a breeze out of the north because of a storm that's mainly going to pass to our east. But we could potentially get some precipitation here across eastern Utah out of that mainly Thursday night into Friday, but not expecting any major impacts here in Utah. Overnight temperatures here across the state. A lot of us about 35 to 45 degrees when you wake up tomorrow morning, Thursday morning. Throughout the day tomorrow, it's going to become breezy. So yes, it'll be a really decent first half of the day and second half of the day will also be pretty decent. It's just going to be noticeably breezy, maybe even gusty in some areas with some wind gusts possible more than 20, 25 miles per hour, but highs tomorrow into the 70s. For St. George, your hour by hour forecast throughout the morning and day, you're going to have those temps mid 50s when you first wake up into the mid 80s tomorrow. So tomorrow at four o'clock, close to 65 to 70 for much of the state into the 50s in the mountains. And then we're going to have the wind kicking up tomorrow. Take a look at your screen here as we take you throughout the day by five o'clock. Our wind is going to be gusting close to 20 to 25 miles per hour for much of the Wasatch Front. So if you are out enjoying the patio this evening and your umbrellas are still up, I would go ahead and take those down tonight before you head to bed or tomorrow before you head out for work. St. George mid 80s tomorrow, 84 on Friday and then into the 90s. So from tomorrow through next Tuesday, you're going to have temperatures around 85 degrees plus and that is going to become problematic for our snow melt. So we're going to have slot canyon concerns and also any running water concerns, especially with kids and pets for the Wasatch Front 71 tomorrow, 67 on Friday. So we'll see a tiny, tiny cool down into Friday back into the mid 70s on Saturday and then 80s for us across the Wasatch Front Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. We'll talk more about our flooding concerns and what we can expect over the next two weeks coming up in your super seven day forecast. We'll be right back. In national news, Disney Parks and Resorts is suing Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. DeSantis appointed a special board to oversee Disney's special taxing district. That board voted to nullify an agreement that would give Disney rights to develop the surrounding land over the next 30 years. Now, Disney is accusing DeSantis and his board of retaliation. Disney's CEO has spoken out against Florida's don't say gay law. Disneyland and Disney World are common destinations for Utah vacationers with the conflicts between the Disney Corporation and Florida's governor. Will you still go to a Disney park on vacation? If you'd like to take part in our non-scientific poll, just click the QR code on your screen right now to let your voice be heard. Results, by the way, are in real time. Hunter Biden's attorney met with the Department of Justice today. CNN sources say the DOJ is investigating the president's son for possible tax evasion and making false statements. He has not been charged. Hunter Biden also says he's done nothing wrong. Former Arkansas Governor Asa Hutchinson is running for president. The Republican says he wants to set himself apart from other candidates by showcasing his career in public service. He's been a congressman as well as DEA administrator and has worked in Homeland Security. Hutchinson also says he believes voters don't want a Biden-Trump repeat race. The House passed a bill today that would raise the federal government's borrowing limit in exchange for spending cuts. This as the national debt continues to grow with the clock ticking down to a potential U.S. default. 
Today's bill involved days of negotiating among Republicans. Its passage now puts House Speaker Kevin McCarthy at the negotiating table with the White House. We send a message to President Biden that we've had enough and he needs to negotiate with, with the Speaker. Happy to meet with McCarthy, but not on whether or not the debt limit gets extended. That's not negotiable. The bill, as it stands now, would likely never pass the Senate. President Biden has promised a veto if it makes it to his desk. Republicans in Montana have voted to bar transgender lawmaker Zoe Zephyr from speaking on the House floor to the rest of, or for the rest of the 2023 legislative session. It's the first time in nearly a half century that Montana lawmakers have looked to censure one of their own. It follows Zephyr's participation in a protest after the Montana House voted to ban gender-affirming care for children. This marks the second time this year state lawmakers have taken action against each other for protest involvement. Two lawmakers in Tennessee were briefly expelled for supporting gun control demonstrations. Demolition is finally underway for one of the Draper homes that slid off a cliff over the weekend. I'll tell you what's next in the cleanup process and the hurdles crews will have to overcome. Why did Draper let anyone build houses on this site at all? We talked to the city manager and the state senator for this neighborhood. Kids are terrified by stuff like this. It causes an incredible amount of trauma for them. An attempted kidnapping near Salt Lake City Elementary School. Why parents are upset they didn't hear about it sooner. They need to be accepted and loved, not yelled at. How one school in West Jordan is taking care of its students and teachers' mental well-being. Why they say that's so important. Coming up, RSL and the U.S. Open Cup. And can Donovan Mitchell and the Cavaliers survive? Welcome back, everyone. We are tracking breaking news in Linden right now, where a motorcyclist is dead after they were hit by a car. Linden police say it happened near the Walmart right at the intersection of 700 North and State Street. Take a live look at the scene right now where police cars are blocking the road. Again, a motorcyclist is dead after a crash with a car earlier this evening in Linden. We do have a crew on the way to the scene right now. We will bring you updates as we learn more. Four days after two homes slid off a cliff in Draper, what was left of one of those homes is finally gone. Today, developer Edge Homes de demolished the rest of the house that partially collapsed last weekend. You can see what's left of the disaster from the Sky Fox drone. People living in that neighborhood have been ready for cleanup to begin since last weekend. Fox 13 News reporter Emily Tenser has details of today's demolition and what's next as our team coverage begins. And just like that, after not even three years on Canyon Edge, this is how it goes down. But better than how it fell over the weekend. I think they're doing as good as you can expect. Um, you know, who plans for this? It's been obviously hectic, uh, a little scary, you know. Crews demolished what's left of one of the Draper homes that collapsed off the cliff Saturday, and what was left was really only the master bedroom and entryway. There was nothing to clear off the next door lot since that home slid off in its entirety. Mayor Troy Walker says the next step is assessing the third evacuated home nearby. If this is unstable, they'll likely just tear it down, you know, here, so we don't have to have it go in the canyon. The next step is going to be cleaning up the canyon. And that cleanup process will be a feat of its own. The mayor says the city will likely cut an access road into the canyon to haul the homes out of there. We've done it before, so it's not unprecedented for us. And we revegetate it, but it's probably going to disrupt the trails for a few months. It's been an exhausting few days for neighbors. They're grateful for the teardown, but are tired of dealing with curious onlookers. The noise is frustrating, but at least it means progress now, whereas this weekend it was just kind of frustrating. So. The city also wants unnecessary traffic to stay away. There are already reports of people sneaking into the canyon and stealing from the wreckage. We just want people to stay away. These neighbors need a break. They had 
thousands of people up here over the weekend and it's stressing them out. The mayor says there are officers ready to issue trespassing tickets if anybody gets too close. He says there will, quote, be no sympathy. They will be expected to pay the full fine. Reporting in Draper, Emily Tensor, Fox 13 News, Utah. Now, you may have watched that video of the houses sliding over the cliff in Draper and asked yourself, why did the city let someone build there in the first place? Fox 13 News investigative reporter Nate Carlisle asked that question today and whether state laws need to change. We've had multiple developments that are on geologic hazards. We've had faults, landslides, debris flows where development has been proposed. David Dobbins is Draper's city manager. We still haven't found a way to unilaterally say no without the risk of the taxpayers of Draper having to buy the land at fair market value. That includes when Edge Homes applied to build on the slope in Hidden Canyon Estates that gave way early Saturday. While Draper has an ordinance addressing building on certain slopes, Edge submitted engineering plans intending to make the houses stable. Because at some point we are required to let people do with their property what they want to do within the constraints of our regulations. In some respects, a city is a little bit handcuffed based upon representations of a developer. Kirk Cullimore is the state senator representing residents in Hidden Canyon Estates. He's also an attorney. I've been up there to inspect and, and I feel for those neighbors. He said the landslide will spur a discussion in the legislature of whether to create more regulations for developers. But Cullimore isn't necessarily ready to give cities that unilateral power to say no. Rather than just saying no, maybe we say this land is high risk. And if you want to develop here, then, you know, maybe there's an additional impact fee to, to mitigate those potential, those potential risks or something like that. I asked Cullimore if the legislature would consider making developers like Edge liable for the property value loss to surrounding homeowners. He said that becomes difficult policy. Unfortunately, this is a little bit of a buyer beware, you know, and so um, I think I think these types of incidences are going to cause more homeowners to really ask questions and maybe get proper insurance to cover that type of stuff. Dobbins, the city manager, said he'd like more tools for cities to be able to say no to risky development. For now, homes in this Draper neighborhood are valued up to a million dollars or more. In Draper, Nate Carlisle, Fox 13 News, Utah. With all the talk around Edge Homes, I did some research this afternoon on the early beginnings of the company and also how they operate today. They started in Utah in 2008. Co-founders Joel Harris and Gordon Jones said at the time, home sales, especially new construction, was difficult given the recession and housing market slump. But by 2014, they were named the sixth fastest growing company by Utah Valley 360 and sold nearly 600 homes that very same year. As of today, according to the Edge Homes website, they have 25 communities they're currently building and selling homes in from Harriman as far west as Eagle Mountain and then stretching south all the way down to Vineyard. Within these communities, there are single family homes, town homes, and condos. Now, according to this acquisition summary by Sumitomo Forestry, that's a Japanese investment firm, they purchased 70% of equity shares in Edge Homes in February of 2017 for a purchase price of $63 million. Stay with Fox 13 News on air and online as we continue to track the fallout of this disaster in Draper. A failed kidnapping of a young Utah girl followed by anger from parents where they say the investigation went wrong. And it was a perfectly average but beautiful spring day here in Salt Lake. We've made it to 65. That's a normal high for this time of year. But now we're headed into record territory. What to expect over the next couple of days. A 53-year-old man is in custody after Salt Lake police say he tried to kidnap a 12-year-old girl on her way to school yesterday. Investigators say Jose Munoz now faces charges of attempted kidnapping. But as Fox 13 News reporter Darian Dubrul explains, Liberty Elementary School parents are upset the school did not tell them sooner. 
like many Liberty Elementary School parents, Fiona Robinson Hill and John Wilson were concerned when they heard about an attempted kidnapping near their children's school. The demographic of Liberty is working parents, working family members. So a lot of the students are responsible for getting themselves to school. In a situation like this, you've got the victim of the the attempted at kidnapping herself, then every other school student there is a also a victim of the of what has happened. Kids are terrified by stuff like this. It causes an incredible amount of trauma for them. Hill and Wilson say it's concerning they first heard about Tuesday morning's events from the local news that night. A lot of our children were already in bed. <laughs> How could we have talked to them if we didn't see any news stories or social media postings? We had this little window of time this morning from when they get up to when they head to school to say, hey, guess what? Somebody was almost kidnapped at your school yesterday and kind of deal with all the reactions and process that to them and kind of get them in a better place before they have to go off to school. In my mind, the school district, by not letting us know about this and giving us a chance to deal with it yesterday with our kids, they've inflicted more trauma on every single student that goes to that school. After hearing concerns from parents like Hill and Wilson, I reached out to the Salt Lake City Police Department and Salt Lake City School District to ask the reasoning behind the delay of release of information to parents and the public. We had information that we knew who the suspect was and, you know, at this point we didn't determine that there was a threat to the community. So in order to continue our investigation and make an arrest appropriately, we determined at the time, you know, it probably wasn't appropriate to release that information. Salt Lake City School District told me it was not the school or the district's decision to delay telling parents and shared an email sent to parents Tuesday night, which says in part, I want to also let you know why you didn't hear from me about this incident earlier today. This is an ongoing investigation and we were instructed by law enforcement officers to not share information until they had gathered more information. But still, Hill and and Wilson have questions about the time gap between the arrest and the release of information. They got their man relatively quickly. There was no justification at all not to let the public know once somebody had been arrested and they'd identified who it was. I'm very glad that this person was um, apprehended and that um, he's no longer out on the street. But the community wants to help. The parents want to help. But we can't help if we don't have the information. In Salt Lake City, Darian DeBrule, Fox 13 News, Utah. The Jordan School District is helping to keep students and teachers mentally healthy. We'll show you what they're doing with their wellness room. And Rudy Gobert and the Timberwolves were eliminated from the playoffs yesterday with Donovan Mitchell and the Cavaliers join them tonight. And the Grizzlies going after the third playoff win tonight against Idaho. And they pull off another upset. The highlights are on the way. Welcome back, everyone. Helping students and teachers feel and be their best. One school in West Jordan is helping to improve their community's mental well-being. Fox 13 News reporter Mike Lee Gooby shows us how staff and students use wellness rooms at Sunset Ridge Middle School. I think uh, the best part about having them at the Mindfulness Center is because since Legos can be very calming. Hunter is a seventh grader at Sunset Ridge Middle School. One of his favorite spots at school is the Mindfulness Center. Just a really nice place and it's a place where you can feel safe. During their school day, kids can come to the mindfulness room and take a few minutes to calm down. I think it's important for students to know that it's okay to have the feelings that they're feeling. It's okay for them to, uh, to feel to feel sad or anxious, um, but it's more important for them to know that they've got a safe space at the school where they're able to come in here, regulate, and get back to class. Uh, come in to sit, play, read, color, swing, and pause, and it's making a difference. A lot of students that have come in here when they're angry with the teacher or angry with another student or angry just because of life circumstances at home. Um, and I feel like them coming down here first has prevented classroom disruption. Not just for students. If the adults aren't okay, then the kids don't stand a chance. This inspired a special Zen center just for staff. Teachers, staff, nutrition workers, a dedicated space where if they need a minute, they can just come and relax. Teachers say getting to access a place like this where they can either get a massage, lay on the couch, listen to water sounds, or just be for a few minutes helps them be better teachers, be better for their students, and help their kids where they're at. Have a space where I can reflect and come back and bring myself back, then it's so much easier for me to teach the students and 
show love to them because that's all they need. So if I find myself getting short-tempered, I know I have a place even at work where I can go. With all the stress that teachers and school staff face, getting away from the chaos of a classroom can help. And some days during my prep period or during lunch, I am done. Like, I have had it. I come up here and I'm like, this is the best thing ever. If you're like, oh, anxious, angry, a nice place just to breathe, relax, reset. In West Jordan, I am Mighty Legal B, Fox 13 News, Utah. All right, I just got this picture in on our Facebook group, Utah's Weather Authority. And if this doesn't get you excited for the seasons to come, I don't know what will. Absolutely stunning day today in Sevier County. Thank you so much to Carrie for sharing this. You've got the red rocks. You also have the snow capped mountains off in the distance. So thank you so much for sharing that picture with us here in Salt Lake right now. It's 59 degrees. It's still pretty warm. 56 in Ogden, 53 currently in Provo. For the rest of tonight, we're going to have some passing clouds. Tomorrow morning, a mostly clear and cool start. And then throughout the day tomorrow, becoming partly cloudy and it's going to be pretty breezy tomorrow. Our wind is going to ramp up. It'll be probably about 10 to 20 plus miles per hour, closer to 25 to maybe 30 miles per hour around the evening commute tomorrow. And then as we warm up late in the week into this weekend, we have snow melt concerns with flooding. So satellite and radar right now here across northern Utah. I've got some clouds passing through Brigham City. These are going to continue drifting to the southeast. Overall, really, really nice spring day. Perfectly average today and in mid to late April. We love an average day. So mid 60s normal for this time of year and that was our high today. 65 degrees. Perfectly normal day. And then tomorrow at 7 a.m. it'll be about 35 to 45 here across the state. Throughout the day tomorrow we're going to return above average a few degrees. I do want to point out there's going to be some showers and thunderstorms off to our north and off to our east tomorrow. We're also going to get the wind out of this. So most of the precipitation stays off to our east. We might see some showers and thunderstorms mainly in eastern Utah come Friday. But with this passing storm system, mostly tomorrow, just seeing the impact of wind here across the state. So for tomorrow in Salt Lake, 71, Park City, 54, Moab tomorrow, 77, St. George, mid 80s. Chance of precipitation is really low through this weekend. And then we could see some more showers returning early next week for Ogden, for Provo. Same thing, dry through this weekend. And then some more chances for storms next week. Low confidence in how that could play out, though. So just know it's a possibility. And for St. George, you also have a pretty dry seven-day forecast. Looking at our seven-day precipitation outlook, lots of precip Texas into the southeast. Here across Utah, one of the driest states over the course of the next seven days. For St. George, 85 tomorrow, 84 on Friday, into the 90s, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. But you're around 85 plus through the next five, six days. For Salt Lake, 71 tomorrow, Friday, moderate air quality, 67. We're gonna be into the 80s starting Monday and Tuesday. Then for week two, normal to below average temperatures returning for the 4th of May through the 10th of May here in Utah. Well, after the Utah Jazz were knocked out of the first round of the playoffs last year, they traded away All-Stars Rudy Gobert and Donovan Mitchell. Gobert and the Timberwolves were eliminated in the first round yesterday. Mitchell and the Cavaliers faced elimination tonight. Game five in Cleveland against the Knicks. The team that almost traded for Mitchell knocks down the three in the first half. Mitchell led the Cavaliers with 28 points, but the Knicks were always in control of this game. Jalen Brunson, who killed the Jazz in the playoffs last year, scores two of his 23 points. Then Mitchell's shot is short, and the Knicks push it the other way. Obi Toppin with the slam. The Knicks won at 106-95 to win the series four games to one, advancing to the second round of the playoffs for the first time since 2013. John Moran and the Grizzlies trying to stay alive with a win at home against the Lakers in Game 5. LeBron James with the alley-oop jam to start the game for the Lakers. But Morant and the Grizzlies came to play. Morant with the bucket put Memphis up by six in the third. He finished with 31 points. Then it's Desmond Bain drives and scores. Tough shot. He led the Grizzlies with 33 points. Memphis beat the Lakers 116-99. But the Lakers still lead the series three games to two. 
After just getting into the playoffs, the Utah Grizzlies upset Idaho by winning the first two games in their first two playoffs games. Up in Idaho with three game, game three tonight at the Mavericks Center. The Grizzlies have still had scored an ECHL record 58 wins in the regular season, 23 more than the Grizzlies. They took the lead with that goal 35 seconds into the first period, but the Grizzlies answered back in the second. Cameron Wright shoots and scores, power play goal, tied the score at one. Then later in the second, it's Mick Messner on the breakaway. Two on one for the Grizzlies, and he feeds Dylan Fitz. He scores, that put the Grizzlies up two to one. Idaho tied it up later in the second period. That's the score right now. All tied at two late in the third period. Real Salt Lake also playing tonight in their first match of the U.S. Open Cup in Las Vegas. RSLs was one and done in this tournament last year, but they're hoping to make a run this year. But this match is still scoreless. Both teams getting some good looks to score. There has to be a winner. So if it remains scoreless, it will go to extra time and then a penalty shootout with another match on Saturday against Seattle. RSL is playing a lot of reserves tonight, so it's a great opportunity for them. But this match, they want to win it. They're playing on a baseball yeah. field. We're used to oh. seeing all these Major League Soccer stadiums. Yeah. Vegas doesn't have that. Oh, dear. <laughs> baseball field. It's grass and, you know, shorter. It's not as big as it normally would be. So, so what do they do for the dirt area of the we'll field? Put some grass Just over. to cover it. Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> Staple it down. Okay. <laughs> Make it work. <laughs> all right. Yeah. Thanks, Jeff. We'll be right back. Utah State University opened a new park honoring an alum. USU cut the ribbon on Swenson Park today. It's named after poet and Logan native Mae Swenson, who attended Utah State Agricultural College, which later then became USU. Pretty little park there. And check this out. Students at Jordan High School and Bella Vista Elementary worked together today to bring monstrous creations to life. Third graders drew pictures of monsters, which were then handed off to the students in the Jordan High sculpture class to be turned into 3D plush. Those are so cute. Isn't that, fun? Yes. that is great. They have a new friend to sleep with tonight. Oh, <laughs> new <that>. stuffy. <laughs> <laughs> Quick cast is next. <laughs>